Could Moldova be the next Ukraine? This weekend's presidential election gives Moldovans a choice between pro-EU and pro-Russia policymakers. But with accusations of Kremlin interference and vote buying, will the results be respected? And will Moldova be able to maintain a peaceful balance between East and West? I'm Andrea Sankin. Today's newsmaker is Moldova. It's a struggle for many countries in the former Soviet sphere, managing EU and NATO accession ambitions alongside citizens who feel a closer kinship with Russia. Moldova is a prime example of that struggle. Like Ukraine, it has a region controlled by Russian-backed separatists called Transnistria, but it also has a large population of westward-looking citizens eager to join the EU. On Sunday, Moldova's registered voters will not only be able to elect their president, but they'll also be asked if they want EU accession inscribed in their constitution. Their choice is being watched closely by powers in Moscow and the West. Here's a look. A little corner of Europe that doesn't exist on a map. Nestled between Moldova and Western Ukraine is the de facto region of Transnistria, home to a significant Russian population. Transnistria declared independence from Moldova in 1991. A year later, a 1,500-strong contingent of Russian troops arrived, where they remain to this day. I would like to remind you that on the territory of our country, we have troops of the Russian Federation, which are deployed here illegally. It is not possible for us to feel really safe or secure, especially when we watch what's going on in Ukraine. Moldova lies at the heart of the tug of war for influence between the EU and Russia. And on Sunday, the people will have their chance to choose sides in both a presidential election and a referendum on EU membership. The vote comes at a time where Russia appears to be winning the war in Ukraine, pushing Moldova's pro-EU president to speed up efforts to distance the country from Moscow. There's a big milestone ahead for the people of Moldova. Citizens will soon go to the polls and decide sovereignly whether to anchor Moldova's European future in your constitution. I encourage Moldovans to use their vote and express their free choice. Moldova's incumbent president, Maya Sandu, is banking on both securing a second term in office and a yes vote in the referendum. She won a landslide victory in the 2020 presidential vote, and her pro-Western party captured a parliamentary majority the following year. Since then, Moldova has faced significant challenges, including high inflation, fueled by reduced Russian gas supplies, and an influx of refugees from the ongoing war in Ukraine. Polls suggest that Maya Sandu will get 36% support, her top opponent, Alexander Stoyanolu, a former prosecutor backed by the pro-Russian Party of Socialists, is on 10%. And that means the vote may go to a runoff on November 3rd if she's unable to get 50%, as the polls predict. In the lead-up to the elections, allegations of Russian interference have intensified. On October the 4th, police warned of potential disruptions orchestrated by criminal groups with Russian backing. The Moldovan government has accused Moscow of attempting to destabilize the electoral process, which the Kremlin denies. Uh, we are certainly aware and we are seeing attempts by the Russian Federation to destabilize the Republic of Moldova using its political proxies within and outside the country, fugitive oligarchs uh, that are trying to funnel uh, cash into the country to bribe voters, to bribe protesters. But our institutions are growing more resilient by the day. As Moldova approaches this critical election, the stakes could not be higher. With rising tensions and the spectre of foreign meddling, Sunday's elections could be a turning point, defining Moldova's journey for years to come. Well, joining me now to debate how much is truly at stake in Moldova's election are, from Kiznau, Deputy Director of the Institute for European Policies and Reform, Mihai Mugadea, 
From Moscow, Deputy Foreign Editor at Komsomolskaya Pravda Daily, Dmitry Babich. And from New York, former Ambassador and Permanent Representative of the Republic of Moldova to the United Nations, Vlad Lupin. Thanks all so much for being with me. Uh, Mihai, let me start with you because you are in Moldova. You know, some of the press reports around this election uh, could make you feel that things are very ominous in the country, as in people are really in fear of how Russia might respond if, if Maya Sandu is reelected and, you know, the EU referendum passes in favor of EU accession. Is that definitely the case from Moldova, or are some of the press reports kind of exaggerating the level of fear that we've been hearing about? I think uh, the overall situation is quite positive in a sense that uh, we are uh, having quite a calm context for uh, for these elections. Indeed, there were a lot of uh, attempts to corrupt the uh, voters during uh, this electoral campaign. Um, the police and the intelligence service spoke about uh, roughly 130,000 voters that were corrupted with money from Russia in order to vote for the candidates uh, supported by Russia via its proxies uh, in Moldova. They also spoke about uh, around $15 million that are invested every month by Russia for electoral corruption in Moldova. It's not something that happened only in the last month. It's something that is uh, happening in Moldova for at least uh, half a year. Uh, after, uh, in June this year, uh, Ilan Shor, one of the kleptocrats that uh, left Moldova um, three years ago and is convicted currently in Moldova, uh, announced in Moscow that he is going to basically corrupt as many people as possible for this uh, electoral cycle. So I would say that people are quite aware of this phenomenon. Um, we are indeed um, assessing the situation and we are trying to understand how big will be the impact of this uh, okay. uh, phenomenon over the results of the elections. And hopefully we are going to have uh, quite uh, a good um, uh, environment for uh, the election day on Sunday. Okay, so let me ask the ambassador how reliable you think the election results will be. When you have you know, high-level officials talking about Russian oligarchs funneling money into Moldova to buy off voters and, and bribe protesters. Uh, do you worry that many Moldovans are vulnerable, or do you think democracy will truly come through in this vote? Well, um, we have to take into account that Moldova has suffered from economic underdevelopment, and it, it that is the reason why about 130,000 people have been affected by this corruption scheme buying the votes. So um, the process itself, the electoral process itself, is going to be, as usual, nothing new is going to be free and fair. Hmm. The main problem is going to be the choice of the voters themselves, whether this is a genuine choice or this is a purchase choice taking into account the investment that we have seen and we've heard about, including from an investigation which infiltrated um, this scheme to buy voters. That's the concern, not the, free and, not the process. It's going to be free and fair, but the voters' choice. And there is no way one can influence the voters' choice in this kind of circumstances. Hmm. if the, the the votes are purchased, you know, and you cannot even claim that the process was not free and fair because the process was free and fair, but there was something that interfered in the voters' choice themselves, and that is outside of the standard electoral procedures. Okay. So in these circumstances, I think there is one more thing to consider, and that is the concern that have has been expressed by the Moldovan government that these voters may be asked to protest and potentially participate in uh, disruptive behavior, mass mm -hmm. um, uh, protests. And um, the same has happened in 2022 in February when an FSB officer was arrested for coordinate, coordinating this kind of disruptive behavior, aiming presumably okay. at toppling the government. 
Let me ask Dmitry then, uh, from the Russian perspective, do you think the Kremlin is, is trying to interfere in these elections? And uh, if so, really, to what end? Will it get what it wants? Well, if you want the Russian perspective, then the question is uh, asked in a wrong way. Uh, what we are concerned about is that there are about one million Moldovan citizens living in Russia who have the right to vote, who must have a, uh, a chance to influence their country's choice. And unfortunately, the Moldovan government gave them a chance to vote only in Moscow in the embassy. So hundreds of thousands of people will not be able uh, to participate in the election simply because the Moldovan government doesn't trust them. It thinks that these people are under Russian influence. Even the words that you chose, you know, like Russian interference, oligarchs. I just oligarchs asked if you believe Russia is interfering. Let Didn't mean to skew the question. Uh -huh. Yeah. No, I, it means, you know, your choice of words is absolutely wrong. Uh, because Moldova for many years was ruled by an anti-Russian oligarch, Vlad Pohatnyuk, the leader of the so-called Democratic Party of Moldova, the person whom the European Union and Russia rightly accused of stealing $1 billion in government money in Moldova. And he was extremely anti-Russian. It was under him that it became almost impossible for Russian uh, uh, diplomats to walk in Moldova, for Russians uh, to visit uh, uh, problems over with Russian public figures visiting Moldova. Uh, and somehow the West was quite happy with him. Uh, he was uh, ousted, basically, by a coalition of pro-European and what you call pro-Russian parties, including the Socialist Party of Moldova. Uh, and now you keep talking about some mysterious Russian oligarchs, Russian influence. The EU is influences the, these elections in a much cruder way than Russia, quite openly. And the problem is that, uh, you know, I talk to a lot of people in Moldova, there are people who want to go to Europe. There are people who want to uh, be closer to Russia. The majority wants to have relations, good relations, with both Russia and the European Union. And unfortunately, for many years, it was Brussels who made first Ukrainians and then also Moldovans make this terrible choice. You are either with us or with Russia. That was never Russia's policy. Even. Uh, uh, before the, uh, you know, uh, e even after 2014, uh, when uh, that uh, basically coup d'etat happened in Ukraine, Russia kept saying that we don't uh, want to force Ukraine or Moldova uh, to be with Russia. What we suggest okay. is joint economic space, trade. So in this way, you can get richer and join Europe as richer nations, not as poor relatives. Right now, Moldova and Ukraine uh, are trying to join U Europe uh, as poor relatives. These are the two countries that were considered the poorest in Europe since the early 2000s. First, it was Moldova, okay. as the poorest country, then, then Ukraine. That's a terrible result of the EU's policies. Okay, let, let, let me get to Mihai then, because there's a lot to digest in, in Dmitry's analysis there. But, I mean, in part, do you think the EU has been polarizing people in Moldova and in other former Soviet states? First, uh, in Russia nowadays, we don't have one million of Moldovans. We have roughly 80,000 Moldovans. So basically, uh, 12 times less than what Dmitry mentioned before. It's not the data that I uh, found it. It's the data provided by the Russian authorities. Uh, and that's why we are opening only two uh, voting pools in Russia, because also because of the last elections in Russia, we only had roughly from 10 to 15,000 voters who went to the voting pools. So basically, there is no sense to open 1,000 voting pools if there are only 10,000 voters in Russia. And this is the reality that we had for many, many years before. Mm -hmm. Secondly, mm -hmm. is the choice of the Moldovan people to join the European Union. Nowadays, we have between 60 and 65 percent of the Moldovan people that are supporting the EU accession process. That's why they invested in 2020 a pro-European president, and that's why they invested with a large par parliamentary majority a pro-European government in 2021. It's their choice. It's the choice of the people to join the European Union. It's not the choice of the European Union to bring Moldova inside. Uh, 
uh, its structures. That's okay. why on Sunday we are organizing a referendum to prove once again that we are pro-European, that we want to be part of the European family, that we would like to be more interconnected with the European Union, because nowadays 65% of the trade, of the Moldovan trade, goes to the EU, and only about 3% of the trade goes to Russia. That's why Moldova wants to be closer to the European Union. It's the only reliable partner for us, is the most important okay. economic partner okay. for us, and is the organization that can facilitate the development of this country in the coming years. Okay. Let, let me ask the ambassador, though. Is there a question here? Uh, because as Dimitri was saying, that the EU really is more responsible for the polarization and for turning people against Russia when there is an opportunity to kind of have it both ways. Moldova can trade with Russia. They can stop embargoing Transnistria while continuing with EU accession. Is there a happy medium that, as Dimitri says, the EU is actually refusing? Uh, Transnistria was included in the negotiations between the Republic of Moldova and the European Union. Um, Transnistria was exporting uh, the biggest quantities of its export to the European Union. Yes, Moldovans would like to have very good relations with both Russia and the European Union, but that does not mean that they prefer to join Russia. They prefer to join the European Union. The latest opinion polls indeed show that about 63% of the Moldovan population wants to join the European Union. That's a popular choice. That's the majority of the population. Does not mean that we do not want to have bad, good relations with Russia. We want it. Russia doesn't want it. Unfortunately, if we are speaking about the history of the relations between the Republic of Moldova, let me remind you about the, the period before Mr. Plahotniuk was in government. Um, so uh, in 2003, when the Russian Federation attempted to impose a Cossack memorandum over the Moldovan government, uh, the fact that the Moldovan government refused, and it refused because of the popular protests, which, of course, the Russian Federation declared that are not because of the popular protest, but because of the European Union and the Europeans. Uh, the popular protest is something the Russia, Russia may not understand very well. Um, I, I see how Russian authorities are treating protesters back at home. They, they don't agree with them. They arrest them. They put them in jail. Um, you can exit with a paper and, you know, with nothing on the paper, you're going to get in jail. In Moldova, you can protest. It's a democratic country. It's a growing democracy in pain, but it is a democratic country. Okay. In 2003, we refused to sign that memorandum. What happened? Russian Federation introduced embargoes, gas new prices to the government that was pro-Russian. Okay. That was before Mr. Plahotniuk. That was well before Mr. Plahotniuk. And this continued. These sort of behavior continued throughout time. How kind of, what kind of trust can we talk about in the Russian, um, in the Russian Federation, okay. if this behavior continues for years? Yeah, let me. Let uh, me and it does not even stop. I'd even like now, it continues. Try to better understand then Dmitry's perspective here, because Dmitry, you seem to think that Russia really is only interested in trade. Uh, with, with all of its former Soviet states, for that matter, regardless of whether they become EU members or not, and that you think the EU is the one that's responsible for uh, compromising good trade relations between, between uh, Moscow and the, and the EU with the former Soviet states. I mean, are you really sure that that's Russia's only interest, just free trade? Well, like any country, Russia is also interested in security, uh, Russia is also interested in a uh, sort of a balanced view of the past, uh, not to uh, blacken uh, the 200 uh, plus years that Moldovans and the Russians lived in the same state. Uh, so, the, of course, there are many other issues, but uh, uh, there was never any talk in Russia about taking Moldova back to Russia, as Mr. Ambassador said. And again, uh, to uh, uh, answering your question, right now the EU imposed so many economic sanctions on Russia that joining the European Union automatically means that there will be a lot of obstacles in trade with Russia. But that's the situation of today. If we talk about the earlier period 
which Mr. Ambassador mentioned. It's interesting how he says our government refused COSAC's memorandum. And at the same time, he says that government was pro-Russian. I remember that government was headed by Vladimir Voronin, uh, the leader of the Communist Party of Moldova. So Mr. Ambassador has to kind of um, uh, get straight here, get his act straight here. Uh, was it his government uh, or was it uh, uh, some other government? Uh, was it pro-Russian government or was it pro-European government? If that government refused uh, the, the solution suggested by the Russian representative Kozak. That solution, by the way, initially was agreed by Mr. Voronin, and uh, basically it meant reconciliation between Transnistria and Moldova. Okay. Uh, the, the conflict started, as you know, in 1991, and uh, right. I think Moldova was very happy not to lead it to the same degree as uh, the inner conflict in Ukraine. Okay. Uh, let's let's but, see if we can I move know, this. I, I, I just, know, we, we're I, down to our last few minutes. Wait. So I, I'd like yeah, to move it forward move a little bit. Before we go back can again, we, I, let me just yeah. ask one last question because Mihai, I, I know it sounds like kind of the, the description that Dimitri has given as to what would constitute a more conflict-free, peaceful relationship with Russia, it's, it gets a bit vague when it comes to interpreting history correctly, um, not just trade, but then the other implications of having an EU embargo on Russia that includes then new states if should they come to fruition like Moldova. So I have to ask you then finally, I mean, should Moldova actually be worried about becoming the Kremlin's next focal point, a la Georgia and Ukraine? Should Moldova genuinely worry or is it not near that kind of precipice? The Moldovan authorities are the Moldovan authorities are worried about the provocations and the destabilization attempts that are uh, coordinated by Russia. This is what is worrying us: the fact that Russia uh, is willing to invest in, in a very much uh, a very big amount of money into destabilizing Moldova, not into supporting our country towards uh, modernization and reforms, but actually in destabilization, in security threats, in hybrid threats. This is what we witnessed in the last years from Russia. And unfortunately, I cannot say anything good about our current um, uh, bilateral relations with Russia, because uh, from Moscow, we only hear threats. We only hear messages regarding uh, the bad uh, behavior of Moldova uh, uh, related to, uh, you know, uh, okay. Russia or other, other stakeholders there. We, give, we don't hear any positive messages that Russia would like to, you know, be a reliable partner for Moldova. Okay. Uh, Let me ask Dimitri time. quickly, because I need to get final comments from, from Dimitri and from the ambassador. Dimitri, I mean, is that fair? to say that they've just heard nothing positive from Russia. Could Russia be doing a better job of making Moldovans feel that they shouldn't feel threatened? My, my, my answer is not going to be yes or no. Moldova should be worried. It should be worried that the EU and Ukraine uh, would attack uh, Transnistria and restart the war between uh, Ramp Moldova and Transnistria, which, uh, thank God, ended in August 1992. There is a real danger of that happening after uh, Mrs. Sandu wins the election. And I'm sure she will win this election because uh, all the major polit political figures which could challenge her are out of the country or in jail. Mr. Dadon has been in jail for a long time. Uh, Mr. Ilan Shore is out of the country. Uh, Renato Usate is also not participating in these elections. Look at the sociological polls. These okay. were real uh, uh, adversaries. These were potential adversaries for Mrs. Sandu. For Ms. Sandu, they are all out, so she will win this election. And okay. then the danger will rise of the war in Transnistria. Ambassador, quick one minute left. Moldova should be um, worried? In 2003, we saw that the, the plan that they attempted to implement was about controlling veto powers by Russian citizens in Moldova. Uh, that was the plan that um, we were discussing earlier. So, yes, absolutely, we should be worried. In 2022, uh, the Russian map was shown by the, the Russian map of attack was shown by the Belarusian president, showing that Moldova is going to be attacked. 
if Russia is successful in the south of Ukraine. We have seen also in 2022 an attempt by FSB to overthrow the government. Uh, we have seen also in 2023 a plan to interfere in the Republic of Moldova that was finally uh, leaked from one of the units, Kremlin units. So, yeah, we, we certainly should be worried. We have okay. also seen the attempts to buy voters. Uh, yes, we, hoping, we should be worried. I was worried. hoping to end on There a, is nothing, there um, is no European Union plan like that. Yeah, I was hoping um, to end on a more optimistic I, note, Ambassador, but uh, unfortunately we're going to, to have to leave it there. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists so much for being with us. Our viewers, of course, for joining us as well. Remember, you can follow us on X. And do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.